but we need to live in tension with it. So he energetically addressed uh, issues of justice and righteousness according to the context of his time. So we may have to translate some of those for our day. Uh, each sermon, each tract, each letter was written to a specific group, a specific situation. But at various times he talked and he wrote and he preached about money. And in this presentation I want to uh, share my understandings of Wesley's attitudes about money uh, is gleaned from these various resources, uh, sources. Back in uh, 1989, in the Quarterly Review, the theologian uh, Theodore Jenkins built a case as Wesley as the forerunner of liberation theology. And uh, you know, Jennings was quite a liberation theologist, so uh, a theologian, so uh, he was trying to uh, bring him on, on, in his camp. And he said that Wesley's theology is based on a radical economic <coughs> ethic that entails a preferential option for the poor. I mean, there's the right code words, right? Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> uh, for example, from his earliest days, Wesley visited the poor, and he urged his colleagues to do the same. He believed that, and I quote, visiting the poor was an indispensable form of obedience to the command of Christ. <coughs> There's no doubt that Wesley believed in empowerment. You just didn't visit him, you empowered him. He helped the poor organize clinics and cooperatives and credit unions. And he didn't think much about sentimentalism about the poverty. Here's a quote from Wesley. I have known one poor person in London picking up from the dung hills, sticking sprats and carrying them home for herself and her children. I have known another gathering bones which the dogs had left in the street and making broth of them to prolong a wretched life. He tried to get persons out of poverty, not <coughs> adapt to it or be happy with it. In that way, at least, Wesley was certainly in harmony with liberation theology. I can find no record of Wesley ever quoting from 2 Corinthians 8 verses 13 and 14. That's just following the passage that uh, uh, Bishop was using, but his teachings seem consistent with what Paul says in this fundraising tract uh, to the Corinthians. Paul wrote, it isn't that we want others to have financial <coughs> ease and you have financial difficulty, but it's a matter of equality. At the present moment, your surplus can fill their deficit. In this way, there is equality. That's the Common English Bible uh, translation. From the statement by Wesley and the passages by Paul, it appears that they may have even endorsed the concept of income re re redistribution, which would be considered a heretical concept by American cultural religion. Mm -hmm. But it does fit liberation theology. This is one side of Wesley, but it's not the whole of Wesley. Wesley could also be labeled a pietist. He focused on individual righteousness, even in economic matters. Some of Wesley's words would probably have been cheered by sweat shop, in, sweat shop industrials blah, 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 blah. Uh, <laughs> at the beginning of uh, the, that industrial revolution time. For instance, he urged sobriety, honesty, and industriousness from the workers. What modern CEO wouldn't want that preached to their workers today? <laughs> There's no record of him ever advocating higher wages for workers as far as I've been able to ascertain. Most of his words about social action focused on the individual and the individual's righteousness. For the most of us, pietism and liberation theology seemed like kind of strange bedfellows. But Wesley held them together in a creative tension. Righteousness was the bedrock of social redemption. There's a strong dimension of Wesley's pietism that tends to align, align him with liberationists. For instance, his understanding of charity he affirmed that charity is not an end in itself. It's essential in some circumstances. But he urged people to do things with, to urge people to do things with people, not to do things for people. Now, I would suggest that in our churches, whether we're looking at mission in our neighborhoods, our communities, or around the world, are we more engaged in charity or are we more engaged with, engaged with development? 
I'm, frankly, uh, some of you know my wife and I uh, are pretty involved with uh, the African country of Malawi, and we wrestle with this all the time. And I don't think there's a nice, neat answer, but I think we ought to, as Christians in mission, be wrestling with it and uh, struggling with it. While referring to the poor, uh, Dr. C. Eric Lincoln said, made the comment that we are willing to be their advocate, but not their friend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wesley believed that friendship was an important part of charity. He did not keep a safe distance from those whom he helped. We are to give ourselves as well as our money. I'm going to take a, a moment here just to tell a story. Uh, I have a son that uh, is a pastor in, in Indiana, and uh, for nine and a half years he was pastor of a small church up in South Bend, Indiana. And it's uh, the church had primarily poor uh, Mexican uh, or Hispanic, uh, white, and black people who lived where the workers for the old Studebaker uh, factory used to work before Studebaker <laughs> vanished. And one time we were talking and he and something was said about the people that come by the church. And I said, well, Mike, uh, how do you deal with the people that come by asking for money? He said, well, we don't have any money to give. What we do is we walk with them. I said, huh? He said, remember Acts 3. Peter and John going to the temple. The beggar, they said, silver and gold have we none, but stand up and walk. Yeah. He said, what's the next verse? I don't know. I kind of, my mind shut off after that verse. <coughs> he said, and they walked with him into the temple. And it, boy, that hit me. It's pretty easy for me to give somebody a dollar. To walk with them is a lot bigger commitment. Mm -hmm. so, anyway, <clears throat> Lovett Weems, the... Uh, seminary president noted that Wesley believed that God has appointed the poor to receive our giving. A summary paragraph of uh, Jennings' essay is, the preferential option for the poor is not one theme among others, not something that can easily be relegated to an occasional foray into social questions or ignored in pursuit of more important things like church growth and evangelism personal holiness or final salvation. It's the test and norm for all of these. I think what Jennings is saying, we ought to put our money where our mouth is. Well, I think Jennings is on to something, but I also think he goes a little too far. And I want to pursue this by turning to Wesley's preaching on money, and especially the sermon that probably most of us have heard about, where they had the threefold outline, earn all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Now I'm going to take those three points of the sermon one at a time and kind of unpack them for you. So let's start with earn all you can. Wesley said it, but he didn't mean it literally. Immediately after saying earn all you can, he spends the next page and a half of the sermon as it's written down describing exceptions and qualifications. <laughs> Some ways to earn money are proper, some are not. He wrote tracts and letters to clarify a statement. For instance, in a letter to a Quaker opponent to slavery by the name of Anthony Benizé, he said, Mr. Oglethorpe, you know, went so far at, as to begin a setting a colony without Negroes, but at length the voice of those villains prevailed to sell their country and their God for gold. Who laugh? at human nature and compassion and defy all religion but that of getting money. In another, in a powerful tract, Wesley wrote against slavery saying, better no trade than trade procured by villainy. It is far better to have no wealth than to gain wealth at the expense of virtue. Better is honest poverty than all the riches brought by the tears, the sweat, and the blood of fellow creatures. In our day, maybe running a drug cartel might be a way to make a lot of money. But that doesn't mean it's a legitimate one. Uh, uh, any more than being a slave trader in the 18th century. Manipulating the stock market might be, a, it seems to be a way that some people made a lot of money. That doesn't make it right. To understand, earn all you can, 
we need to remember the time and the place when Wesley said this. This was England in the 18th century, a monarchy. If you were in the royal household of England, you did not earn a living. Earning a living was beneath you. And Wesley was saying by earn all you can, there's nothing disgraceful about going out and earning a living. That word might be well for us to hear today. Somehow the royalty in England, that they thought they were exempt from the sentence to Adam and Eve when they left the garden that thereafter the human being shall earn bread by the sweat of their brow. Wesley wanted hearers to know that earning a living was respectable. <clears throat> At the time sermon that was preached, uh, Wesley and his term defiled himself <laughs> by preaching out in the open air to minors. And he also visited people in prison. Why were they in prison? Debtor's prison. I never could figure out how you could pay off your debt if you were in prison. But a case can be made that we devalue physical labor today in America. Ditch digging is not exactly a compliment. Or have you ever heard it say, I'm just a common laborer? Would Brother Wesley, what would Brother Wesley say about our pecking order of salaries and income today? At the very least, I think he would claim that earn is not a bad word, yet I doubt that Wesley would use that same phrase if he preached the sermon today in a culture where the income of some athletes, actors, CEOs, TV evangelists, Wall Street manipulators, and even some tall steeple preachers may seem over the top. What would Wesley say about our current debate in America about comparable worth and living wages? I don't have an answer to those questions, but it seems to me these are theological issues, not just economic ones, and we as a church need to struggle with them in faith. Let me give a personal example. As so many of you know, I worked at the General Board of Discipleship for many years. During that time, I was once granted a three-month leave of absence to do some research for a book I was writing. The work of the stewardship unit at the board got along just fine without me for three months. But suppose one of the two support staff in that unit had been out for three months. The thing would have been chaos. What justified me being paid five times what the secretary was? Or the person who works in the plant being paid one two thousandth of what the CEO is paid today. I think those are moral issues. Can the church address them? So what does the phrase earn all you can mean today and what can we use as a substitute? That, I don't have the answer to that but I'd like you to consider that. Let's turn to save all you can. To our ears, that phrase sounds like a little advice to, advice to lay a little aside, or maybe a lot aside, for a rainy day. It's music to the ears of the banker or broker, right? <laughs> Can you imagine the Nashville area United Methodist Foundation putting Wesley's words in the cover of their annual report? <laughs> no, I, they won't, but <laughs> the problem is that's not at all what Wesley meant by saving. Simply put, Wesley meant by save all you can, don't spend money for what you don't need. Ouch. <laughs> the wise counsel of his day, of holding, uh, in our day, of uh, holding in reserve an amount equal to, say, three months' salary would not have cost Wesley's mind. He couldn't have imagined that. The economic systems were different in his day. Granted, capitalism was kind of coming into the fore at that time, but capitalism in the 18th century in England and capitalism in America today are really different animals. And, uh, you know, Wesley didn't have any children. His relationship with his wife would not be used as a paradigm for a family ministries workshop. Uh, retirement was a concept he could not have fathomed. And so I think we need to take all those into consideration a little bit. However, let's not throw out what Wesley is saying. Remember, Jesus said to his disciples, when he sent them out to share the message of salvation, take no bag for your journey. Don't take stuff you don't need. For Wesley, Jesus' command made a lot of sense. 
If we saved in the sense of not buying stuff we don't need, we could eliminate a lot of storage units, large moving vans, and maybe even baggage limits on airplanes. <laughs> and how much stuff is in our closets? Mm. I want to meddling in there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, the General Board of Discipleship, you know, is, is housed in the Denman building down on Grand Avenue here in Nashville. And it gets named, of course, for Harry Denman, the, the layman who was the head of the Board of Evangelism during the really the glory days. And Harry, you know, was a crusty old bachelor. Uh, he was known for having one suit of clothes which was always rumpled. And once in a while people would see his terrible suit and buy him a new suit. And usually within 24 hours he'd given it away. Wesley was, a, I mean, Denman was a true Wesleyan. <laughs> He didn't see any sense of having something he didn't need. <clears throat> in 1776, the commissioner of the excise, which would be Britain's vernish of the IRS officer, wrote a letter to Wesley. He was sure that Wesley had neglected to, de to declare some silver in his latest tax filing. Wesley, in a letter, a rather curt reply in September of that year, said, Sir, I have two silver teaspoons in London and two in Bristol. That is all the silver which I have at present. I will not buy any more while so many around me want bread. Clearly, Wesley believed there was no room for ostentation or accumulation in a Christian lifestyle. Great possessions, he said, were the mark not of divine blessing but of satanic temptation. At the same time, Wesley was troubled by the results he saw of people successfully struggling to get out of poverty. He said, as riches increase, so do pride, anger, and love of the world in all its branches. So he looked upon prosperity as dangerous to the soul. In a sermon entitled, Spiritual Infatuation in the World, Wesley chastises Christians for ignoring the command of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, stop collecting treasures for your own benefit on earth. He affirms the need to provide for ourselves so as not to burden anyone, and even there acknowledges that parents ought to provide for their children the necessities of life. But he reminds his hearers that, quote, riches do not send a person to hell, but the desire for riches do. <laughs> He says that having riches is bad enough, increasing them is worse. So for Wesley, anybody that has more than the necessities of life is rich. Back in 2001, two Balawians were brought over to the U.S. to attend a three or four day workshop on children's ministries that was downtown in Nashville. And I had met uh, these people in my trips there in 2000 and 2001, and uh, uh, so we arranged for them to stay at our house after they flew in on Friday until the conference would start uh, mid-afternoon, Sunday afternoon. And we were going out the door Sunday morning to drive to church to hear John preach. <laughs> and uh, Grace was engaged in conversation with me. And I have no idea what we were talking about, but I remember vividly she said, yes, but you are rich. Mm. I felt like I'd been kicked in the stomach. No one had ever called me rich before. I mean, I grew up in a home where we had running water. In other words, you took the bucket out, you ran out to the well, you pumped the well, you ran back into the farmhouse with the water. Uh, you know, uh, my first pastoral appointment uh, had seven churches in the hills of southern Indiana. My total travel <laughs> and salary was $4,600 a year. And both my wife and I had done a very poor job of, of economically choosing parents. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, I, but I realized from her point of view where most of the homes in her country, if you walk into the home, there's no tables, no chairs, you sleep on a mat on the floor. Uh, there's no stove. But you have a fire outside. Why? Well, I was rich, but that was that was a hard pill to swallow that I was rich. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, 
Anyway, uh, Wesley's words, remember, were at a time when Adam Smith and his economic theories were being uh, formed in, in England and getting a foothold there. It was the beginning of modern capitalism. And Wesley was very concerned, particularly with the accumulation of property, land. <coughs> his greatest concern was that if land was in too few hands, injustice was the, the result. Now, I'm old enough to remember the turmoil in Central American countries about 25, 30 years ago. In El Salvador and Nicaragua, many observers believe that the fact that 80 to 90% of the land in each of those countries was owned by between 1 and 5% of the people was a reason why there was civil war. Now, when I think of more contemporarily, uh, wasn't too many years ago we got awfully worried in America about all the buildings that the Japanese were buying, and now we're getting worried about all the Chinese are buying, but somehow we don't seem concerned about all the property that U.S. owns in many other countries. Uh, you know, uh, well, <coughs> I'm meddling again. <coughs> Wesley abhorred accumulation, as I said, even though he's reported to have earned about 1,400 pounds per year from his writings at the end of his career. He is reportedly once said to his friend, if I leave behind me 10 pounds, you and all mankind bear witness against me that I have lived and died a thief and a robber. Uh, many of you know that uh, I was widowed about 11 years ago and then uh, nine years ago, uh, I married a widow woman that I'd, I'd known her husband and uh, we were all in the same Sunday school class at Belmont together. And, uh, the night before we got married uh, at the dinner, we gave each of our five living children an envelope. And I, since we were moving into one house, I could sell the house I was in, and uh, we had some money. So we gave them a check for $5,000 and a letter that said, this may be all the inheritance you get. We plan to either spend or give away the rest of it. <laughs> oh, that was fun. <laughs> so much fun. <laughs> I thought of maybe I was just being a, a hint towards Wesley at that time. <laughs> so I think the question really for us is, how do we use Wesley's understanding of lifestyle? How do we communicate without sounding like we're Scrooges, trying to keep people from having any fun? Should we even use the phrase, save all you can today? I, I, I doubt it. But what can we use as a substitute? What are the implications for lifestyle on decisions we make and the decisions of the churches where we work. And to kind of tie back to what the bishop was saying, I believe the biggest reason why most of our people in the church don't give more money is not that they don't want to give more, but they got themselves spent so much in so many different directions, they are captives of their debts. And so, to, without addressing the issue of accumulation, I don't think we're going to solve the, the so-called budget problem very well. Oh, oh. That's Herb Mather's digression. So we get to the third part of the sermon. Give all you can. This follows directly for Wesley from earning your money honestly, spending it for only what you don't need, I mean what you, only for what you do need, and then he said give all the rest away. Wesley practiced what he preached. You know, his first year as an Oxford fellow, he was paid 30 pounds. He knew it cost him 28 pounds to live, so he gave two away. Now, uh, a professor at Vanderbilt Divinity School told me that Wesley, you know, salary kept going up as a fellow, but they never invited him back to the campus. They said he was too cantankerous. <laughs> but he got up to 70 pounds, but he still lived on 28 pounds. Apparently, inflation was not an issue in those days. And he gave all the rest away. In his sermon titled, On the Danger of Increasing Riches, <coughs> Wesley straightforwardly was about his conviction concerning what we are to do with money. He says, Do you not know that God entrusted you with that money, above all the necessities of life, of your families, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to help the stranger, the widow, the fatherless, indeed, as far as it will go, to relieve the wants of all mankind? How can you defraud the Lord by applying it to any other purpose? He was rather directive, wasn't he? 
While vigorously opposing accumulation, he did not believe that money itself was evil. It is not fair to use the phrase, give all you can, I believe is the, fa is the theme for your next financial campaign at church. Perhaps we should use Wesley's words, to, we might be able to use Wesley's words to justify endowments as a way after we die to continue to feed the hungry, to care for the widow, the stranger, the, the homeless, etc. But I think we have to be very careful about what conclusions we draw here. What, uh, Jennings again, come back to his article, he says, Wesley's call for stewardship of money was never connected to any campaign to subscribe a budget of his movement. It was always stewardship for the poor. Now, that's true, but I want to take a little bit of quarrel here with, with Jennings. In a technical sense, he's right. But do you remember how class meetings started? The, 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 the group had just bought a building called the Foundry. They had a debt on it. They needed, they realized if they could get a penny a week from every person who is part of this Methodist groups, they would be able to pay off the debt in the foundry. So he organized them in these class meetings as a means of collecting the penny per person per week. <coughs> and it developed into a wonderful spiritual dynamic group uh, <coughs> where we, we don't use it to collect money at all anymore. And I'm not complaining about that at all, but I think it's rather interesting how it actually started. <coughs> uh, never know what God is going to do with things we do. Sometimes God can turn things that were meant for harm into good or meant for just kind of nothing into something good. Sometimes we can turn the other way of things around too. <clears throat> so, um, uh, now I want to say just a, a, a word about Wesley's, the theological foundation of Wesley's understanding of money. In a sermon titled, The Good Steward, which is based on Luke 16 too, Wesley says the steward is a particular kind of servant. We are not proprietors, but we are entrusted servants. He spells this out in very traditional stewardship theological language. God is the owner. We are God's stewards. Whose steward we are is crucial. We are indebted to God. We are at liberty to use everything as the master pleases. Everything includes our hearts, our minds, our imagination, our memory, our will, our affections. He says, it is not your own unless you are the Lord of heaven and earth. <laughs> so, faith formation of the giver then is the essential core, not institutional preservation. Now, I, I'm not opposed to even something that some people would call gimmicks, but we better have the building built on good foundations. <laughs> That's the issue that I'm trying to deal with at this time. It's the heart of stewardship theology, if not its practice. Nearly all stewardship literature begins with Genesis to, and saying the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and all that is therein, Psalm 24, verse 1. But this is not an easy concept to communicate in our modern culture in America. Our culture seems to rebel against this. We think we own something. Excellent. Our name is on that deed. We got the title for the car. Our name is on the checking account and the bank cards and etc. If it isn't ours, how can we give it? <clears throat> how do we communicate this biblical understanding of we not being owners in a culture where we feel like I earn everything I can't? And that's until we retire and then say, I work just as hard, I just don't get paid for it. <laughs> now, Wesley is not afraid to use the word generosity, though. And I assume by his use of the generosity, he means giving all is generous. It is sermon based on 1 Corinthians 13. Wesley points out that generosity without love do does no good for the giver. He claims we cannot be happy if we give without love. Now, when I was a pastor, I would often quote that 2 Corinthians 9 verse, God loves a cheerful giver, but I would point out the church could use the money of Grouch's giving too. <laughs> <laughs> the difference is that 
It blesses the giver if you're a cheerful giver. It does not bless the grouchy giver. I want people to find joy in their giving. Yes. <clears throat> um, perhaps what we need to do is restore giving as a symbol that God is the owner of all. And can we really, uh, really pull that off? I think that's a question. I also want to say something about Wesley and tithing. Uh, because Wesley never advocated tithing never preached a sermon about it. Now he didn't mention tithing a few times when he said called it the Jewish portion. Not politically correct. But he felt the standard for giving ought not to be a percentage but it ought to be earning your money honestly, spending it only for what you don't need and giving all the rest away. Now uh, some of you know that uh, Cliff Christopher and I wrote a book together on tithing and so I'm not opposed to tithing because I found it as very helpful discipline to move ahead. However, I think Wesley would be horrified by the statement in the United Methodist Book of Discipline that says that the tithe is this, the standard of giving for United Methodists. Now another place it says the minimum goal of giving. That's much more Wesleyan. Uh, but I never was able to get that one out because it looked like I was attacking tithing and that's, even though people don't tithe, they don't want it attacked. <laughs> Ooh, that was nasty, wasn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> one seminary dean said to me one day, the issue is not what will I give, the issue is what, I'm gonna, what am I going to keep for myself. That's Wesleyan. That's Wesleyan. <clears throat> So, I, you know, this issue has been around for a long time. And I won't claim that, uh, that there are any nice, easy answers for it. But what my appeal is, is that we start talking about these things in a setting of openness in our churches. Because until we come to grips with our relationship to money and what money and the gospel have to do with one another in our lives, I don't think we're going to solve the, quote, the financial problems of the church. Now, Wesley once advised, do nothing on which you cannot pray for a blessing. Every action of a Christian that is good is sanctified by the Lord of word and prayer. It becomes not a Christian to do anything so trivial that he cannot pray over it. So money is meant for holy use. Can I, can you pray a blessing over the money we spend at the store, at the restaurant, for vacations? for entertainment, as well as for the money we put in the offering plate. I think that's a spiritual issue. Mm -hmm. I close with these words from Wesley's sermon on the use of money. In the hands of his children is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, raiment for the naked. It gives to the traveler and the stranger where to lay his head. By it we may supply the place of a husband to the widow, the father to the fatherless. It may be a defense for the oppressed, a means of health to the sick, of ease to them that are in pain. It may be eyes to the blind, the feet to the lame, yea, a lifter up from the gates of death. Boy, folks, you have suffered in this extremely hot, stuffy room through a lecture that, instead of a scintillating uh, sermon or something. But anyway, any, uh, any questions, comments, uh, reflections that you want to make? Because we got a few minutes yet, I think, to go. I'm glad, I'm glad this is recorded. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Were yeah. you the one that came up with the idea that uh, you can be guaranteed that if you tithe, you, there is one guarantee that you will not be a selfish person? Well, I never came up with that. I think I'd like to ponder that a little bit. I, yeah. I I, you. I, however, I, I think one of the real things that hit me about tithing in 1986, when I came to the board, first week I was at a meeting at 475 Riverside Drive, the God Box in New York, the, the old Commission on Stewardship of the National Council of Churches. And at noon, after morning meeting, we went down to the basement. I went through the, the cafeteria and was eating, and this tall, lanky guy uh, sat next to me, and he said, who are you? 
I said, Herb Mather, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm coming on as the uh, head of the stewardship unit of the General Board of Discipleship. Oh, I quit tithing 10 years ago. I said, oh, yeah, I give 40% now. And I said, oh. <laughs> and then he went to tell me a story. And I have known some tithers that were so proud of the fact they gave 10%, but they weren't going to give a penny more. I'm not sure that tithing itself is righteous. No, and it, you you asked, you opened up for my opinion, I gave it to you. <laughs> yeah. Herb, you mentioned that our denomination, uh, Wesley had a, a problem with uh, buildings and the accumulation of buildings, and we are a denomination with the accumulation yeah. of buildings. We are actually building rich and probably people poor. Mm -hmm. What would you suggest in the Tennessee Annual Conference that mm -hmm. we can start working more collaboratively away from just our local congregations into more of a shared vision within a district area or with a neighborhood. You really want us to be a connectional church. I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We're living in that reality. Uh, I wish I knew the answer to that because yeah, there, there are uh, uh, the, the church my son is pastor of in Indianapolis once had 3,300 members and for the last 15 years hasn't had over 600 members. Uh, keeping up a building like that is a challenge. And uh, I'm sure that uh, where your pastor, why there's some major expenses that are, you know, a blessing and curse all at the same time. Uh, so I, I have not really thought about that in the way of building as much. But I think shared space is certainly something that, they, that can be looked at. People have so much a, so much tie to space. And let's go back to a biblical story of Naaman the leper. Remember when he got healed after Doug, in, what did he want to do? He wanted to take a cart of soil back to Syria. Why? Because that God was where that soil was, and or the the uh, how can you sing the Lord's song in a strange land? The place, and I've never quite figured that. Out. I think some people that got a lot more sense and scholarship along location, but um, uh, but th that's you know, how do you deal with the psychology of it as well as just the the practicalness. But now, it, you know, most of my work in the last uh, probably 10 years has been in the area of mission. And I look upon the fact that you're at, at Belmont, well, we can, we can organize a mission team. But uh, here we had Jimmy Winters from a little church out towards uh, uh, Clarksville to go with us. And that's be great, you know, because why, why should people who might want to be a part of a mission team but can't be a part, uh, not a, a part of a big enough church, how can we connect better about that? And I think that the, the whole realm of connectionalism is a nice word, but we need to live into it more. Herb, on that subject, just take Nashville, for example, the Nashville District. In our properties, we have enormous wealth enormous wealth. Some of those properties have passed their day. They don't serve the area, barely serve the people who are in those buildings. Right. If we could get Methodists to have a bigger view and look to the future mm -hmm. and start liquidating some assets that go into mm -hmm. the mission development, mm -hmm. it would it, just be a tremendous, yep. tremendous yep. thing. Yep. But, yeah, well anyway. Yep. Well, uh, the, uh, the the farmer who is land rich and cash poor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's, uh, so. Yeah, and and that that would involve a strategy of looking at the facilities and locations that we do need. Mm -hmm. That are the right. They're the foundries. Yep. Uh, but mm -hmm. we've got a lot of properties that yep. we don't need. You know, and the church is not unique in that. Look at all the the look at the uh, Bellevue Mall. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, yeah. uh, just as yeah. an example, well, finally there was redemption, you might say, at Hundred Oaks. <laughs> it was converted. <laughs> uh, 
but we need some con building conversions too, probably. And and maybe we need to be buying those malls, you see, too. Mm -hmm. There's a flip yep. side to that. That's right. Church yep. needs to be buying them, some of them. Mm -hmm. Yep, it might Re be. To reposition ourselves. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. For service. Mm -hmm. Not to have a mall. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, and certainly back 20, 30 years ago, a lot of churches were started in, in sure. malls. Sure. I don't know that that's happening much now. But then the other thing that is happening a lot now in churches, and well, it has been for 15 years, but is uh, large churches are often having satellites, and some of those satellites are d formerly dead churches, you might say. Mm -hmm. And I find that very interesting. Huh? Mm -hmm. I first ran into that out in Baltimore about 25 years ago. Uh, uh, what's, what's the guy in uh, uh, Grand Rapids, uh, Rob? Uh, yeah, Bill. No. Anyway, when he started that church, is he's now gone from it. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they 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 found an opportunity of a, a mall owner developer that dumped dumped a thing to them at, at an amazing price, mm -hmm. and then they have all of a sudden they have this this mm -hmm. amazing yeah. amazing facility, yeah. and it was on the market empty for years. Mm -hmm. How many of those do we have yeah. in this city? Yeah. I've got a question. Could you help state a couple of questions? I serve, I've just started a new appointment in a church that is struggling with, with debt, with buildings that are not paid for. As we look through uh, to a budgeting process and trying to think theologically about where money is spent, where it's paid for debt or paid for, for the work of mission in our community or e even through our connection, could you help restate a couple of questions that could be shared as we think about where it is that we spend uh, our, our money priority, or where we spend our money, what our priority should be. It sounds like, from what I'm hearing you saying, that the church is in the same boat as a, a family who has got themselves with too big a mortgage and car payments and, uh, and school fees and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so how do you untangle from that is really a, it, you aren't starting with a blank slate. You gotta start with where, where you got. <clears throat> And to me, one of the most important things, and this is not direct, is to affirm the good that is being done with the money that is being spent. And uh, again, I, I don't know what sort of things are going on in your church, but I think of if the church I go to, here we have 20 12-step groups that meet in that church every week. And and the, probably most of the churches here, many of them have room at the end and things like that. It looks like all that we, we think of, well, the heat and the lights, that's stuff for ourselves. But some of that heat and light and janitorial fee is mission to make it possible for these groups to use that church. Can we interpret that so that the people can see that? I mean, don't, not trying to make it more, but just... Uh, when I was, went on conference staff in Indiana, I started going to St. Mark's Church in Bloomington, and the pastor there started doing something. The first Sunday I remember him doing it, he said, just before the offering, when you folks put your money in the offering plate today, would you remember the children back in our Sunday school wing? We have 20, 25 preschool kids back here every Sunday. Those children are learning about Jesus. They're learning that God loves them. Some of that money you put in the offering plate today buys color crayons for those children. Some of it buys teacher's help so the adults who work with them know how to communicate Jesus, know how to communicate God's love. Pray for those children as you put your offering in the plate today. Every Sunday we got some sort of reinforcement like that. And that made a real difference in that church that was saddled by a huge debt when a conference had given them a loan when they started the church and said, you don't have to start paying it off for 20 years. <clears throat> Not a favor. So 20 years later, hardly anybody was around <laughs> that was there at the beginning because the transition of that neighborhood. And suddenly, why do we have to start paying this off? But that, frankly, that technique, gimmick, you might say, but I think people need feedback I want to know that my giving is making a difference. Not just how much am I giving, 
but what difference is it making in the name of Jesus Christ in this world? And I think if you give people feedback, that helps to move that towards enjoying their giving more, finding joy in it. Uh, so that's one of my pet mantras. That, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, folks, uh, I'm going to let you out of this hot, stuffy room, and I'll hang around. And uh, by the way, if anybody is looking for a mission program or somebody to preach on the Sunday, you're uh, wanting uh, to uh, have the, your financial estimate of giving, why well, I'm probably not going to be available this year since I'm going to be out of the country from the middle of September to the middle of October, and then out of state one week after I get back from out of the country. So, but. Uh, I, I enjoy doing that, and uh, and my wife and I love to go and tell about Malawi anywhere, anytime. <laughs> so you go in peace, and may God's peace go with you, and struggle with these things for the glory of God. Amen.